Hi, this is Frank Taylor with Nature at Your Door. And today, I'm not at my door, but I'm at the summit of McAfee's Knob on the Appalachian Trail in the state of Virginia. I hiked up here today to get away from some things and also get ready to go back to section hiking the Appalachian Trail. I've done uh, 480 miles of Virginia's 540 miles of Appalachian Trail, and I'll be finishing up the state of Virginia this fall. But today's episode is not about the Appalachian Trail, but one of the trees that is really common on this section of the trail, and is actually found all across North America. That tree is a sassafras tree. I'm gonna show you how to identify it. I'm gonna show you how uh, to be sure it's sassafras, and it's really very, very distinctive tree and easy to recognize. And the other thing I'm gonna do is talk about its cultural history and use in, uh, by uh, indigenous peoples of America, the Louisiana uh, Creole culture, and how it's used in uh, Creole cooking, as well as its origins in 1860 as the original root beer. So stay tuned and I'll cover sassafras trees in today's episode, how to identify, and some cultural history. Right here in your backyard, you never know what you're going to find. And there's a make this invasive. It's exotic. Dogwoods are flowering. And I just took a couple swipes. Terrestrial environment. Uh, produce seed pollen. And it's... So as I came down the mountain, I stopped to photograph some sassafras trees. And right here at this point, there's a lot of young sassafras saplings just coming up uh, from the ground. And I wanna show you first, how to identify these trees. And it's really pretty easy and it's really pretty cool. So there's a number of different little trees coming up here in the understory. There's some chestnut oak, characterized by leaves with this shape. There is some striped maple, which is characterized by leaves with this shape and a striping pattern on the bark. But over here is the sassafras. And <clears throat> it's easily identified by these very distinctive leaves. Some of the leaves, and many of them on this plant, are trilobed. Some of the leaves are oval or elliptical shaped. And some of the leaves appear as a mitten. And this is a left-hand mitten, as you can see. So it's really fascinating to see how on the same plant, there's three very, very distinct leaf shapes. And this is the only plant I can think of that has such distinctive leaves and three different leaf shapes. So this is a for sure identifier of a sassafras tree. And these are some juvenile sassafras trees coming up here in all right along the Appalachian Trail. You see the white blaze there. And here it's a mix of chestnut oaks, striped maple, sassafras, and some hickories thrown in. And the final confirmation to make sure you positively identified sassafras is to pick up a leaf, break it, and smell it. And it's just the nicest, most beautiful, citrusy, wintergreeny, mostly citrusy odor to this leaf. And so now you know that's a sassafras tree. And every part of the plant is uh, fragrant. The leaves, the twigs, peeling off the bark, and especially the bark uh, of the roots. And it was from the bark, um, uh, distillation of the bark that made sassafras oil, which we're gonna talk about next. So I always say, in nature at your door, you never know what you might find. And while I was on the trail, I was lucky enough to find this Eastern fence lizard. They're so cool. I've done an episode that you can check out on the eastern fence lizard. This apparently is a pretty good habitat for him in these rocky places. And I was very excited to find him. And so I stopped, took us some pictures, and let him on his way. 
So I'm always fascinated by the historical and cultural histories of the plants that I see around me, both at my door and in the forest. Sassafras tree is a native tree to North America, and being a native tree, of course it was used by the indigenous peoples of the Americas long before settlers came here. Some of the first documentation that I was able to find is that it was used as a flavoring and a spice for foods by the Choctaw Indians. As time went by and European settlers, and many of them French, arrived in the southern part of the United States around Louisiana, there's a new form of, of cooking came up. And I'm not a cooking expert or a historian, so I'm gonna kinda tell you the story as I understand it. But apparently they learned about sassafras from the uh, indigenous peoples of the Americas they also were influenced by Western African cooking in stews and soups. And together with the French, they formed this Creole cooking. And the main ingredient in Creole cooking is filet. F-I-L-E with the accent over the E. Filet. And it's the main ingredient in Creole cooking. It's uh, the French word filet actually means ropey or or stringy, which I think gives the soups and stews some of its thickness and as well as flavor. It was used especially when okra was not available to use as a thickener. So this Creole cooking is a mix, as I understand it, of um, indigenous peoples, of the French, of the local people, of the descendants of Western Africa, all mixed together to create this really cool thing. And it's amazing to know that filet is made from the dried leaves and stems of young sassafras trees in the early spring. Another fascinating part of this is that sassafras was the original ingredient along with sarsaparilla in the original root beer. And it dates back to recipes in 1860 where extracts from the bark of the root of this plant and from sarsaparilla was mixed with all sorts of other spices, nutmeg and, and uh, black licorice, I believe, to make a beer called root beer. And the original root beer was alcoholic. Now the root beer you have today that you can buy at the store as a non-alcoholic soda is not from the sassafras tree. It's made from a sassafras-like substitute because the oil of sassafras from the roots contains saffron. And saffron was found in 1960 by the FDA to cause cancer in the livers of laboratory rats. So it's been banned since then. Sassafras oil is no longer used in root beer because of its carcinogenic qualities. But so it's really just fascinating, the history of this tree. And it's so cool because now that you know how to identify it, you're going to see this frequently. And you need to think of root beer and Creole cooking when you look at this tree. So I hope you enjoy this episode of Nature at Your Door. If you like what I do, please subscribe, give me a like, and leave me some comments. I love hearing from my viewers. And I always get back to you as soon as I can, unless I'm away from the internet, like out here on the mountain or I'm on the Appalachian Trail. So stay tuned for the next episode. Thank you for watching nature at your door.